All right. Thank you very much. That was absolutely beautiful. And I'm, I'm sure the reaction in the room is exactly the same. How, what inspires you? What, what keeps you going? I, I, I gather that you love people and you love South Africa so much. But is, is, that, at, is that at the root of it? I think so. Well, partly, Leanne, is the fact that I have been fortunate. And coming from a Christian background, I was informed from a very early stage of my life that you're given opportunities in life, not because you're special, but because that is an opportunity for you to make a difference. And I saw my parents with the little they had made a difference. And I've seen people in my community and all of those heroes that we celebrate to today, the Masisulus, the Data Mandela's, etc using the space they had to make a difference. Yeah, and, ma and make a difference they did. Um, do you feel we're making a difference now? Do you feel our leaders are making a difference now? <laughs> Leanne, I hosted young girls this afternoon and one young girl 17-year-old girl asked me the same question. Yeah. How am I supposed to know? I'm not God. <laughs> they say that. Uh, I think, by and large, the average South African is making a difference. I see people in government who go beyond the call of duty to make sure that somebody's life is improved. Mm -hmm. You will find people in government who won't knock off if a problem hasn't been solved, who will take money out of their own pockets if there's somebody there who needs a service and it can't be given to that person um, at a particular time. So there's plenty of people who are doing the right thing, but we have to look at that Plato thing uh, that I spoke about earlier, that sometimes we do allow people who shouldn't be leading us to lead us because they're incapable of doing more than what they're capable of doing. Yeah. But despite their <coughs> lack of capabilities, we allow them. And here, I'm not talking about leadership at the highest level of society. I'm talking at every stages of society, whether we're talking at a municipality or a school governing board um, in, in these primary schools. Is that Sometimes we just let the loudest among us become the leaders of society. Yeah. But they are in the minority. The majority of people who are occupying positions of leadership are doing their best mm. to ensure that our people get an improved quality of life. That's why we've made strides in the last 20 years. We would have done more if it wasn't for the mischief of some. Yeah. You know, it... it <laughs> All right, you know, one of the, one of the most incredible things was, and, and I mentioned it in the, in the introduction, is when you were named as, as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine. And that is a massive acc accolade to have. But again, I spoke about the reaction to that nomination. South Africans went wild. Um, you were trending for days. I think you were even shocked. In fact, I think you joked that you thought it was a Nigerian 419 scam <laughs> or, or some, you know, you know those emails that you receive saying you've won a billion, a billion dollars because somebody died. I think you thought when you saw you're one of Time magazines, that, that's what you were quoted as saying. But, but having said that, and, and, I, and I do have to, to add my voice to an article that I read by, by a journalist who, who basically wrote that the reaction to you being nominated on that list was the desperation of South Africans to have good, strong leadership. Um, and, and I had to agree at that one point. In fact, there were even international journalists saying that South Africa wants moral rock star leaders like yourself, that we are lacking that. Um, and, and it's unfortunate that people do speak that way. Do you think that the reaction to you 
doing such good work, people loving the work that you're doing, is South Africans craving exactly what you spoke about there at the podium, is that we all want a corruption-free society? Well, I, I would say firstly, Leanne, I, I'm not delusional to think that I'm one of the top 100 influential people in the world. I did accept the, the accolade, of course, with humility, knowing that the important thing is that it highlights the importance of good governance in every nation. And it also highlights the public protector institution worldwide as a partner in good governance. Secondly, I don't really put myself out there as a paragon of virtue or a paragon of morality. My team and I have one aim and one aim only, to do our best in the space that has been given to us. And if society appreciates our best, we celebrate that. And I think we all called upon to do the same thing. Last week in church, I used the example of uh, Esther in the Bible, who was placed uh, in, uh, in, in a particular society at a particular time. All she was called upon was to play her part. And I think that's all we are called upon to do. I do believe, though, that the real heroes are not the public protector team. Mm. The real heroes are the people who report wrongdoing. Some of them lose their jobs because they report wrongdoing. The real heroes are also the people who give us information. Some of them have been demoted or fired because they gave us information. And we need leaders who claim to be against corruption to ensure that they protect these people. Going forward, we need to see a situation whereby we all really walk the talk. When we say we're anti-corruption, let staff members be safe in knowing that they can report wrongdoing without facing reprisals. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, it's, it's difficult not to talk about Nkandla. It really isn't. <laughs> So sh should, we, should we just like get the pink elephant in the room to, to talk? Let's, let's talk about it. You, you, talk, <laughs> you talk about, um, and, and it is, we, we had, the nation has spoken. Um, we know who the nation want to lead us, and that is President Jacob Zuma with the ANC. However, you have found in your review that there was maladministration, that there, there was improper gainfulness out of the president's um, homestead. And at the same time, they now want to in fact take what you have found to court. How does that make you feel? A lot of work, a lot of resources have been put into it. And now you have to go back to court. A government that takes you to court is a good government. <laughs> All right, Ele Seriously. elaborate, Seriously. elaborate. Because that means that government respects the rule of law. There are two things that could happen in a bad society. As government could just ignore. We have countries where judi the judiciary makes decisions and government does nothing. When there's bad governance and, and lack of respect for the rule of law, governments ignore institutions. So we have a good society, an imperfect society, but good in that it respects the rule of law. Um, secondly, ultimately this matter will obviously, when, if ethics fail to resolve this matter, it will end up in court. As I've indicated, in society, the first person that must govern you is you. You've got to govern yourself and understand what is right and wrong and self-monitor and self-censor. The second structure that helps us to ensure this good governance is internal structures such as internal audit, um, integrity units, etc. Again, if they tell you that you have missed a step, the right thing to do is to correct it. 
We come in as the public protector as a third layer, independent arm's length from government, and we tell government what happened wasn't right, fix it. If government doesn't fix it, that means it's a failure again of governance. Then it has to go to parliament. Parliament has to debate it. And that's part of democracy as a dialogue, and that's part of the architecture of our democracy. The good thing about parliament is that the debate is open. It allows you as society to understand what really happened. Because if you take that particular matter, the N investigation, that I've been told I shouldn't talk about, so I will not mention it by name. Okay. Um, there's been so much distortion around what exactly were my findings. There's even been an insinuation that I said the president should not be secured or should not be entitled to security. Whereas the reality is the starting point of my findings specifically says that there's justification for the provision of security if it is requested appropriately. The issue in that report is items that were never recommended by the security experts that went there twice and issued written reports. And those are items you would not find at ADT. <laughs> <laughs> If you will find them at ADT, tell me, <laughs> such as a chicken run, a swimming pool, a visitor center. <laughs> a fire pool, please. A, a fire pool, pool. Yeah. et cetera. Um. So those are things we um, uh, would be discussed properly in parliament. And, and obviously, people would, through parliamentarians, be able to raise questions. Because you are entitled to write to the parliamentarian who is the leader of your constituency and ask them to raise questions on your behalf. And that's democracy as a dialogue. Ultimately, then, these matters go to court. But if I were government, and it's an issue of ethics, I would resolve it within ourselves. Because it's not going to be nice when the judges tell the politicians how to behave ethically. Mm. Mm. It will happen if this matter goes to court. And for us, we're not afraid of going to court. We just said it's premature to do it. Yeah. And secondly, it's a waste of money. My office is a very small office with a budget that is under 2 million. I mean, that's under 200 million. And we don't have a budget for litigation. We'll now take our, lit our investigation budget and litigate. And incidentally, we are now being taken to court every day, including by one minister that we said she was reckless because she refused to give a company a three months handover period. Reckless. She's taking us to court to say it was okay to do it overnight. And in the process, something happened that has cost that department initially 10 million. But she's debating that she wasn't reckless. Yeah. And she wants a court of law to tell her that she was reckless, and it will tell her that she was reckless. <laughs> <laughs> but at a cost, at, at a, a cost, cost, at a cost to us and to the taxpayer. Yeah, which is a problem. Yes. I, I am going to open up the floor. We've got about 15 minutes or so left with uh, the public protector, and I'm going to ask a couple. Wow, Can, did you? <laughs> Did you even know they were sitting there? No. It's the first time we've seen you. Hello. It's so nice to see you. All right. Oh my gosh, there's, there's waving and everything. All right. Are there any questions? We're gonna, we've got some roving mics, so I'm going to get some questions here. Um, there we go. You've got such confidence putting up your hand like that. Um, while we get the mic here, I'm just going to ask you a question as well. You talk about a minister, and let's talk about... Um, let, I'm just going to pick on one minister, because of course the ministers were all announced on Sunday. And, and I'm quite fond of, of him as a person, because I think he's so charismatic. But um, the deputy minister now, Becky Kele, who was taken out of his position because you found him guilty of maladministration. In fact, you also uh, implicated him in the N investigation. Um, and yet now he's back in government. So, so when, when we talk about things like this, you know, and that leadership and that, that moral rock star I'm talking about, um, 
Does it make you worry a little bit, though, that perhaps the leaders that are in place should not be there? Again, that's not my place to decide who should be in leadership. It's for society. What I can say, though, which um, we were discussing with my team, is that when society, when society puts people in leadership, it doesn't necessarily mean you should repeat what you did yesterday. Uh, people have voted different political parties in, in, in various provinces, and when we go to municipalities, they'll vote people. Uh, often the people they will vote in are people who made mistakes previously. I don't think it's necessarily an endorsement of wrongdoing. It's probably in the hope that this time you're going to do things differently and you're going to do things better. It's like an abused spouse, really. Mm. An abused spouse just thinks that you are my childhood sweetheart. You once loved me, and you, st you tell me that you love me, and, and, and they stay. But they don't stay because they enjoy the abuse or they're giving you license to continue abusing. They stay with the hope that you'll change your ways. Nicely put.